You're watching VH1, this is Take It to the Bridge, and I'm Robert Sandel. And it's now my great pleasure and privilege to welcome to the Bridge Studios a man who's produced some of the greatest records ever made, many of them for a popular quartet called The Beatles. And if you haven't guessed his name by now, retune to Children's TV immediately. Anyway, George Martin has just published a book on the making of that most famous of albums, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, and I'm delighted to say he's come in to talk to us about it. George, welcome to the bridge. Hi, Robert. Summer of Love, The Making of Sergeant Pepper is the title of the book. It actually does a lot more than that. I mean, this is, vir this is virtually a mem your memoir of working with the Beatles, isn't it? Kind of, yes, and also of the particular period, because I call it Summer of Love because 66 and 67... I remember very clearly as being extraordinary, uh, revolutionary kind of times in, in social life, apart from music. Uh, everything was happening then. You know, it was the Mary Quant, Carnaby Street. It was, uh, it was a flower power and hippies and love and sex was suddenly invented. Nobody ever heard of it before. Not even you, George. <laughs> <laughs> Especially not me. <laughs> Do you think that something like, I mean, my sense of it is that in a way that, that something like that, that Sergeant Pepper album actually helped to, to create the kind of the, the conditions for the social changes that you're talking about? I suppose it did. I, it certainly wasn't the intention, you know. And, um, a lot of people have talked about this book and the Beatles in particular saying it was all planned, but it, 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 although they wanted, they did what they wanted to do, they weren't setting themselves up as being prophets or anything or, or trying to change the face of nature. They just they just went, wanted to go into the studio and make their kind of music. Simple as that. Before you actually made Sgt. Pepper, did you have any sense that this was going to be the big one? Was there any sort of feeling of that? No, even when I made it, I didn't think it was going to be the big one, as you put it. I didn't think I'd be talking about it 30 years later. Um, but I knew it was going to be different, and, and I was very excited about it. Why did you know it was going to be different? Well, because we'd done different things. I mean, they got fed up with touring. They'd been, by this time, in the end of 66, they'd been... I'd known them for four years, and they'd been working their pants off all over the world, going from one concert to another, to a television show, to a radio, hotel rooms after hotel rooms. And they were prisoners of, the, of their fame. And they got really fed up with it. And so they said, well, we're not going to do it anymore. We're definitely not going to do it anymore. We're going to just make music instead. And we can spend time making the kind of music we want to make, not just a, sink, a simple little two-minute pop boiler that we can perform in front of a... Uh, hordes of screaming kids. They'd always written, up to that time, music which could be performed. Yeah. Suddenly they realised they could write music which just couldn't be performed. The and use the recording studio almost as another instrument? or as It was, and yes, it was like they had, had a new canvas in which uh, to paint. Uh. How much did you actually, how much were you guiding them and how much were you leading them? I know that's a rather broad question. but one I certainly them. wasn't leading them. Uh, I, I, was, I guess I was guiding them. They were they had enormous musical curiosity. They always wanted to find out what was beyond the next bit, you know. And they wanted to explore. And as I'd done a lot of exploration myself, I was able to sort of show them things we could, could do. Things like backward tapes and yeah. speeds and, and all kinds of effects and so on, which they loved. They loved all the gimmicks and yeah. the tricks, you know. If ever I showed them something like that, they would then do it ad nauseum. I know this is an invidious uh, question to ask you, really, but what was the, al was the track on this album, Sgt. Pepper, that you were most proud of? Oh, gosh. I think there are quite a few. Um, I suppose, I mean, there's so many I like. Um, I love She's Leaving Home, although I didn't do the score, and I think it's, it's a terrific, terrific song. I suppose the one I'm most proud of is be being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, because I... I really was part of putting that together as a collage. With all those circus noises. Yeah, all the circus yeah. noises, and yeah. that really worked, and I was very, very happy about that. Yeah. Was it actually, I mean, this is an enormously complicated album to, to make. Was it actually an easy album to make? Was, it, was the working atmosphere quite congenial? Yes, we had good fun. I mean, yeah. it was the happy days before, um, before strife set in. And, uh, so John and Paul were still very much on speaking terms? Yeah, I mean, oh, sure. I mean, yeah. I think John and Paul were always on speaking terms, even when they were fighting each other. Yeah. Um, they really loved each other very much, and there were, there were lots of problems later on. But the nice thing about it was we did actually get back together in the end. Abbey Road was the last one we did, and that was very harmonious. No, but at this time, in Pepper time, um, we were having fun, yeah. and they were having fun. There were a lot of giggles in the studio. Yeah. Among the many interesting sort of sidelights on, on the Beatles' career, in this book, because it really is, you know, your your recollection of, of working with the Beatles over a long period. I think I was most struck by that thing John Lennon said to you in the 1970s that he that he would 
quite gladly have re-recorded everything the Beatles ever did. And he said this to you. Yeah, absolutely. Not exactly a... It shook me rigid. I, yeah. I, I was with him in his Dakota apartment one night. We spent the night together, the evening together, and um, we were just rapping about old times. And he suddenly came out and he said, you know, I wish we'd done... I'd like to do everything over all over again. I said, come on, John, not everything. He said, yeah, everything. I said, you mean you don't think we ever did anything right? Hmm. He said, most of what we did was crap. I said, you can't say it. What about strawberry fields? He looked at me and said, especially strawberry fields, which really floored me. Uh, but then John's uh, dreams were always dreams. They never became reality. Right. He always envisioned things that were more beautiful, greater, extraordinary, more extraordinary than anything he could possibly really realize in, in real life. So this, just wasn't, this wasn't him just sort of petulantly turning his back on his past? No, he was always like that. I mean, everything he did, even after he, he left the Beatles, he still thought he could do better. Hmm. And do you think now that the Beatles, obviously, that they had a career of, what, nine, ten years. Do you think that they were, in a sense, musically, that they'd, that they'd done it musically when they split, or do you think they still oh, could no, have I think, I think if they'd stayed together, they would have gone on doing greater things, but you couldn't expect them to, because... It was remarkable, I think, that they lasted as, together as long as they did. They all wanted their own freedom. They all wanted their own way of life. And they all wanted their own egos back, mm. you know. They, they'd submerged their egos into a thing called the Beatles. And they grew tired of that. Mm. And they got fed up with it. I'm George Harrison. I'm Paul McCartney. I want to be somebody, not just the Beatles. Mm. And I, I knew something of that because I felt something of that too. Everyone referred to me as being... Oh, the Beatle producer, and I got a bit fed up with it. I, I have done other things, you know, I would say yeah, to people. Yeah. And I suppose, finally, George, the question everyone wants to know, really, I mean, why is Sgt Pepper the album that everybody remembers? When, when, the Beatle, when Beatles albums are mentioned, it's always one. Personally, there are albums which I almost prefer to, to Sgt Pepper, but yet I accept the fact that Sgt Pepper is the album that, yeah. that is the I, reference I do point. too, by the way. It's not, it's not my favourite really? album. And what's your favourite? I, I, I've got a, I mean, I love Robber Soul, I love Revolver. I love Revolver. I think Revolver's and, um, But I also love Abbey Road. I yeah. think Abbey Road's super. Yeah. But I think it's an icon. It, it's, it's one of those things that happened at a particular time which summed up the generation. It really represented what, pe what young people were about. Mm. And it became, I don't know, just like anything else, just became something that people will always remember. Mm. I said, this, it's that strange sort of English thing of dressing up that it seems to commemorate as well. I mean, the, there were the Beatles done out in these quite ridiculous costumes. Absolutely really. ridiculous. Uh, Incidentally, do you notice that two of them wear their MBEs on the on the cover? I hadn't noticed yeah. that. No, really. <laughs> oh dear. Well, there's one for pop sociologists to ponder over in years to come. Exactly. George, thanks very much for coming in. Thoroughly recommend this book, *Summer of Love: The Making of Sergeant Pepper*. George Martin with William Pearson, and uh, it's out now. So, and I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on Take It to the Bridge. We'll be back on it's Monday a very night good at reason. 10. We'll be meeting Japanese superstar Ryushi Sakamoto. There'll be live music from new band Ezio. And this, the first new Beatles album for 17 years, live at the BBC, comes out Wednesday of next week. It was unveiled to the world's media today at the BBC studio where most of the 56 songs on the album were recorded. And presiding over this happy occasion was the Fab's mentor and the executive producer, George Martin. I didn't produce these recordings. They were done by countless and nameless, actually, um, producers and engineers in the BBC studios, and done, done frightfully well, too. As Alan's explained, they were all done really quite quickly, and it, they do show how good the Beatles were as a band um, before we started playing tricks in studios. Um, because most of these recordings date from 1963 and 64, uh, in the early stages of the Beatles' career, when, in fact, my job was rather like the BBC. In the early days, my job was just to put them in a studio and record them. And my only contributions were um, perhaps arranging little bits and pieces of introductions and, and uh, solos and endings and that kind of thing, tidying them up, so to speak. But um, I think these, these records show just how good they were as a, a, an entity. And before we started playing all sorts of producing tricks, so um, I hope you like them. He makes it sound so easy. More about and from the Beatles live at the BBC later this in the This way from program. midnight next Tuesday is the Beatles live at the BBC. 56 toppermost of the poppermost recordings from the Fab Four, 30 of which were never actually cut by the band in Abbey Road. 
The album was launched today with a press conference at the BBC studios in Maida Vale, where most of the songs were taped. In attendance were the Beatles producer George Martin, BBC presenters of the time Alan Freeman and Brian Matthew, and us. Well, <coughs> the, Beatles, the Beatles are very special for me because when they arrived on the scene, they were such unpretentious gentlemen anyway. And there was something very spontaneous and something very, very fresh about what they were doing. Funnily enough, they were singing very, very old lyrics, like love, love me do, um, uh, no, no, actually, actually, I don't want to hold your hand, Brian, so, <laughs> so just shut up and mind your own business, love, love me do. Etc. But those those early those early singles that were put out were really very very ordinary, terribly ordinary. But I found that in listening to these very very really banal lyrics about love, there was something very spontaneous about it, and there was something that set you alight. Now, funnily enough, thirty years on, we find that the generation that has just really gone have been very investigative of, of the Beatles' music. And I profit to say that in 10, 20 years' time, succeeding generations will listen to the Beatles' records and they will enjoy them as much as we did originally and as much as the generations did that have come along since. 1962 was when the Beatles came to uh, uh, EMI and I signed them originally. And I signed them not because they were good songwriters, but because they were had great charisma and they had great... Um, I, they, I knew they were the kind of people that would put themselves over as characters to the public. Later on, they showed that they were great songwriters. I think that it was the latter fact that made them such great stars. If they'd been just performers, I don't think we would still be talking about them 30 years later. And along with this, you've got to remember that the song is where the music starts. And songwriters have to be encouraged as well as performers. And I'd like the a and people and record companies and BBC to recognise that fact. That's what we're looking for as well. We're looking for great songwriters as well as great performers. The atmosphere created by an audience at a Beatles gig, and having been, I don't know how many people here have actually been at some mega gig like the Shea Stadium, I was fortunate enough to be there with them, and I can only tell you that you couldn't hear a thing they, which takes up a point that George made, couldn't hear each other. I interviewed them immediately after that gig, and, and John Lennon said, I had no idea what was going on. I couldn't hear Paul, I couldn't hear so-and-so, so-and-so. I mean, so from a performance point of view, it wasn't made by the atmosphere, it was marred by the atmosphere, and you, I'm sure, wouldn't want to hear that on record. If you were actually there, then the performance itself was visually exciting, and who knows what it sounded like, because nobody heard it. We were talking about the l longitude of the, uh, the longevity, rather, of the Beatles' lives. I must confess, when I signed them, I didn't think they'd last more than 25 years. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were there, young Robert. What was it like? It was very interesting listening to all those old guys reminiscing about how great the Beatles were. One of the interesting things to me was that we were actually being played the Beatles album before and after the press conference. It was amazing how few people were actually bothering to listen. And I think it, that was actually for you. well. I think it was actually quite telling of the fact that this is a real, an important occasion in which we yet again celebrate the Beatles and get all nostalgic about them. But I don't ultimately think that this album is going to be something that people are going to be sitting around playing a lot. I think a lot of people will buy it, and it's quite an interesting record. But compared to the Beatles, do you think it'll sell well? Is it oh, going to be yeah. the usual Beatles fans who buy it? I think it'll sell very well. Yeah. I mean, I think. Anyone who's in, you know, seriously interested in the Beatles would go out and buy it. But I think it's going to be one of those albums that people buy, but they don't play that often. You know, they'll listen to it once, they'll maybe listen to it twice, and they'll pick out certain tracks. But, you know, it's, it's very variable. It's quite rough. We shall rough. see. Hmm. Now, viewers with a nerve...